In old age, one of the most important things that an elder will need to do in order to stay happy and healthy is to remain socially involved. This fosters what the researchers call successful aging. Uh, this is a, a pathway through life that focuses on positive outcomes through health and social engagement to achieve an overall state of well-being. And according to continuity theory, older adults strive to remain involved in familiar activities. You know, they want to be in touch with their personal past. They have nostalgia for the things they used to do. So it's important that they are able to satisfy this desire for continuity. Too, too little continuity promotes a feeling that their life is unpredictable, and this can provoke a lot of anxiety and stress. But you don't want to have too much nostalgia. You know, it's, it's fun to think about the past and reminisce and to do the things you used to enjoy, but too much of that is going to promote boredom. So it is important to have that kind of continuity. You just don't want to overdo it. Now, one of the more common things that elders have to face is just everyday challenges that are suddenly becoming more difficult due to their changing bodies and changing cognitive capabilities. So the way that this resolved can be, is resolved can be explained by the competence environmental press model. So we see changes in the individual's competence as they grow older. This refers to their upper limit of their physical health, their ego strength, their sen sensory perceptual, motor, and cognitive skills. And environmental press, that refers to basically those like physical, interpersonal, and social demands from the environment. So it's, it's kind of a, a balancing. You know, they, they want to feel engaged, they want to feel challenged, but you don't want to have too much challenge. You don't want to have too great of a pressure from the environment. And if you do get a nice balance between the two, we call that the adaptation level. That can be defined as the point at which the press level is average for a particular level of competence. And the way that this kind of balancing works can be illustrated in a chart like this one. So you see competence is on the y-axis and environmental press is on the x. And as the pressure from the environment, as the difficulty of whatever task it is becomes greater, a higher level of competence will be required in order to remain comfortable. If an, if, if an individual is more so leaning towards the uh, competence than the environmental press, you know, if, if, if they have a high amount of competence with a relatively middle to low amount of environmental press, that's what we call the zone of maximal comfort. And this is where elders and just people in general, if they find themselves in this area, they're going to be pretty happy with themselves. They're going to be able to accomplish their goals with relatively little effort. Now, if you want them to work harder, if you want them to improve their skills or just really want to challenge them to see what they can do, then you want to push them a little bit higher. You want to have a higher environmental press compared to their competence level. This is what we call the zone of maximal performance potential. So like I was saying, this is where you can get the best performance out of the individual. And right in between the two, where the individual is being challenged, but not too much, that's that adaptation level. Now, if you go too far in either extreme, you'll get to the marginal areas where the person is not as comfortable as they used to be. Like they start to become a bit restless at the uh, left end of the uh, chart and at the right end of the chart, they start to become a bit anxious and stressed out. And if you go even further, now you just fall into boredom or stress. So it's definitely like a balancing act. You know, when it comes to an elder or a person of any age, really, you just want to try to gauge how well they're accomplishing some task as they're trying to accomplish it. And if it is extremely challenging for them, 
you just want to try to help them out, you know, step it back a little bit, try to reduce that environmental press in some way. Maybe you can alter the text to make it a little bit more simple for them. Maybe you can eliminate some of the steps, you know, whatever it is you might need to do, you want to try to get them towards that zone of maximum comfort or the adaptation level. You definitely want to be somewhere in the middle area. Now, <clears throat> as you're doing this, as you're observing the individual, you know, struggle and try to adapt, they're going to respond in a couple of different ways, depending on their perceived level of competence. If the person believes that they're competent enough to complete some task from, you know, this environmental press, that they'll be more proactive. They'll choose behaviors to try to meet these new desires or needs and just exert, try to exert a lot of control over their lives. And like I was saying, this, this is the common response you see in people who believe that they're competent in this particular task, whatever the task might be. But if the individual has a low level of perceived competence, then they'll show a lot more docility. You know, they'll just kind of give up. They'll kind of just let the situation play itself out without getting involved. Allow the situation to dictate their options. They won't really try to get the most desired outcome. <clears throat> now, this last stage of life, stage eight of Eric Erickson's model, is what he called integrity versus despair. And Erickson argues that when people reach the stage of their life, they spend the vast majority of their time just kind of reflecting on everything that came before. They spend a lot of time talking with friends and talking with family about things that used, used to be, uh, times that were better or times that were worse. So what they're doing here is called a life review. They're just reflecting on their experiences and events from their lifetime. <clears throat> I'm sure that you've had these kinds of uh, conversations with grandma or grandpa before. You know, elders do this kind of stuff all the time. You know, they just love to talk about the past. And depending on what kinds of conclusions they make when they're doing this life review, you know, as they talk to other people, as they talk to you perhaps, what they're actually doing is they're trying to come to some resolution here. They're, they're trying to make some conclusion about their life story. And if they believe that they've lived a good life, if they believe they've made some good choices, then they'll feel a sense of integrity in this last stage of life. This is where they just feel like their, their life has been meaningful and productive. They've come to accept themselves and uh, they just feel optimistic about the future. <clears throat> but if, as a result of this life review, if they feel like they've made some big mistake, or if they have some deep regret, then they'll fall into despair. Oftentimes this involves e externalizing their problems, you know, like blaming other people for their situation. And they often report a feeling of uh, meaninglessness to life. Like they just don't know what they're doing or why they're doing it and what's the point of even trying anymore. So it's important for elders to go through this life review and hopefully they'll be able to come to the conclusion that they've lived a good life. And this definitely has a huge impact on what we call their subjective well-being. So subjective well-being is just a general term that we use to describe uh, your life, you know, it's like an evaluation of your life that's associated with how you have these like positive feelings. And just typically, we see that subjective well-being does increase with age, typically. But there's a lot of factors here, you know, it, it varies with the individual's marital status, uh, whether or not they are a hardy personality, the quality of their social networking, uh, their health state, like if they have any kind of chronic illnesses, and just how much stress they have to deal with. Uh, we also see a gender difference. Gender is also a factor. So w older women tend to have less subjective well-being than older men. <clears throat> Here is a chart of how age and life satisfaction are related. Like I mentioned, as you grow older, life satisfaction does tend to go up. Subjective well-being does tend to go up. They're, they're very similar concepts. 
but it's not a straight line. You can see that for many years, it actually goes down, but in the big picture, in the grand scheme of things, it does trend upwards eventually. So yeah, it's around the age of 50 that it starts to climb. And the reason why we see it decline in these prior years is largely due to factors like stress and ch the, the things that create that stress, like work and raising children and things like that. Now, what, there's one thing in particular that can help boost the subjective well-being of uh, a lot of elders and just people in general, and that is being more spiritual. There's considerable evidence that links health and spirituality in older individuals. Uh, a person's religious faith and spirituality are important means for that person to cope with adversity. It's kind of like a sort of spiritual support. This is a type of coping strategy that includes like seeking pastoral care, participating in organized and non-organized religious activities, and just expressing their faith in a god or a greater being that cares for them. Now, it should be pointed out that the religion in question doesn't matter. What really matters is they feel like they're involved. They feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves, something that is going to take care of them. And something that's really interesting about you know engaging in this kind of religious activity from a scientific perspective is that we actually see changes in their brain activity during like prayer. They're very similar to the kind of changes we see during various forms of meditation, but specifically the kinds of change we tend to see are things like improved memory and attention and less activity in brain areas that focus on the self. So it's kind of like they're moving beyond their personal needs, at least for a temporary uh, period. <laughs> 